could you walk us through what a hold me tight conversation is? A hold me tight conversation, very briefly, is a bonding conversation. The tricky part is that as adults, some of us have never seen this conversation. So it's a dance that is foreign to us. We've never had it with our own parents. We've never had it with siblings. We've never had it with previous lovers. Um, we get married or we get committed to a partner. And it's reasonable that we don't know how to go there because many of us, it's just not a drama that we've ever seen enacted. A hold me tight conversation is where one person is able to open up and reach for the other person and share vulnerabilities, talk about their needs and fears in a way that pulls the other person close. It helps the other person reach back and respond. Could you give any examples of phrasing or questions or, sure. or, or, or guidelines <laughs> you provide? That would be, I, I know course. I would love to know, and I suspect others would too. Well, when you don't trust and you don't feel safe and you've never seen a hold me tight conversation, the way it usually goes just naturally as human beings, I catch myself doing this with my husband. If I'm upset about something, like he's been going to bed very early, and that means that we don't have our snuggle time, we don't have our little chat time, okay? And it doesn't seem to bother him at all. Okay? It doesn't seem to bother him. This isn't happening. So this will go on for a couple of weeks. And even though I'm doing this work, there's a certain point where I start to get self-protective and I start to blame him in my head. And I say, he's always too busy. He's got his lists. He's got lists. That's what he, and he's a man and he's got lists. And all he cares about is his list of tasks. And he's just into problem solving and he doesn't think about me at all. And this dialogue will go in my head. So I turn to him and I say, you're going to bed very early these days. Listen to my voice. It's the emotional music. He says, no, I'm not. <laughs> because he hears the threat in my tone. I say, yes, you are. And you've been going to bed for weeks. And I guess it doesn't matter to you that we're not having those close moments. Now, listen to me. I mean, I'm on the attack. And we are acutely sensitive as human beings to signs of rejection or abandonment by the people we love. Acutely sensitive. That's how we're wired. So he hears that he's blown it. He hears it that I'm rejecting him. I'm telling him he's done something wrong. So he says, I don't want to talk about this right now. I say, oh, let me guess. You have to go to bed because you're so tired. <laughs> <laughs> right, so we're off, right? Okay, that is the typical demand withdraw, demand defend dialogue that you'll see in a distressed couple. And it's totally predictable. You can also have it with your kids. I can remember a glorious argument I had in Starbucks with my adolescent son that was just a perfect example of the way distressed couples talk to each other. So I'm blaming and pointing fingers and he's rolling his eyeballs and basically telling me what a dreadful mother I am. So you can have it with anyone, but with partners, it's very predictable and it has everyone feeling completely threatened and unsafe and unable to dance together. If you shift that into a hold me tight conversation, the way it would go is that I would be more able to tune into my own needs more aware of my own needs, accepting of my own needs. And I would realize, oh, I'm really missing those conversations with John. We've been married for 32 years. We're both very strong people, so it's been quite an adventure. So I think, oh, I'm missing those relationships with John. And maybe he doesn't miss them. And oh, that makes me feel really somehow anxious and uncomfortable if he doesn't miss them. Because the big question in love relationships is, are you there for me? Do I matter to you? Can I count on you? Maybe those conversations don't matter to him, but they really matter to me. So I am aware on a different level of me and I'm specifying that scares me a bit that maybe these conversations don't matter to him. I can tune into my own emotions. And then I take the risk and reach for him and say to him, I'm open. I say to him, you know what? We haven't been having our usual talks late at night. And somehow it doesn't look like you miss them. And somehow that makes me feel kind of really sort of uncomfortable. You know, it almost feels like I'm, I'm not sure that that 
closeness matters to you. And so I could get angry about it, but actually what's happening is it sort of scares me a bit because I need those conversations. Now, I've talked about my fears and my needs. I can only do that if I have some sort of model that it's okay to do that, that that doesn't mean I'm a wimp or mentally ill or weak or pathetic. From my point of view, it's strength to do that. And that's what we teach. And it's strength to do that. And that's what securely attached people can do. They can reach from a position of vulnerability. So I say that to him. And that pulls him. He says, oh, you're right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I really like those. I really, I do, I do want those conversations. So I've just been so exhausted and I've been doing this and I haven't wanted to tell you how stressed out I am. So then it becomes reciprocal. I say, oh, I didn't know that you were so stressed out about this decision we've made and that it's taking up all your energy and you're worried about it. And so then we start to have an open, responsive, engaged conversation where we can share vulnerabilities, comfort each other, and you're literally better at tuning in to each other. And I think that's because when I feel safe, I can tune into you. When I think about the people I can dance with in tango really well, it's the people I feel emotionally safe with. And I know that there's no mistakes because mistakes don't matter. We're just playing. Then I relax. I'm in my body. I tune into their cues and we move together naturally. So that's kind of what happens. And it's a hold me tight conversation. And it's sort of cascades. Each time you have this conversation, it's your nervous system goes, ah, this is comfort. This is home. This is safety. This is, this is what I need. And you see your partner as a resource. You see your partner as somebody who can provide this safety, comfort, caring, reassurance, social support. If you want to use a psychological formal term for it, you see your partner as this person and your partner connects and you know how to do this dance. This dance is innately rewarding. It creates joy in people. You don't have to persuade people to keep doing it, like going to the gym or meditation or their communication skills. People will do this. Once they know how to do it, they'll keep doing it. And that's why I think we get good follow-up results. Because once you start having these conversations and It's very moving sometimes to see people's response. Like people will start to cry and say things like, when they discover these hold me tight conversations, people will say, I'm thinking of one man who said, I never knew that you could talk to somebody like this. I never knew that you could ask for these things and that she wants me to be vulnerable to her. I never knew that. I never saw that growing up. I didn't know people did that. And then he wept and he turned to the therapist and said, I've been alone all my life, haven't I? And that, what attachment science tells us is that emotional isolation is toxic for human beings. I mean, we found out that in the pandemic, but we still don't get it. I wish we would get it on a different level. It's toxic for human beings. It's not who we are. And when people start to have these hold me tight conversations, all kinds of amazing things happen. They don't just understand how relationships can be and how you can shape relationships. You don't have to just have them happen to you. You can shape love. They understand something very deep about themselves. Couples grow each other in safe relationships. Couples grow each other. I watch severely traumatized people learn to trust another human being by having these hold me tight conversations with their partner. And it changes everything because they have a secure place in life for the first time. They feel seen, they feel accepted, they feel held. And once you feel seen, accepted, and held, there's a natural human growth process that happens. Attachment of science is all about development of the personality. There's a natural growth process. 
So we tune into that natural process in the hold me tight conversation. And those conversations predict over study after study after study after study, those conversations predict success in EFT. They predict more secure bonding. They predict better sex, more sexual satisfaction in couples. They predict any sort of measure of good, positive functioning you can imagine, those bonding conversations predict all the good results we get in EFT and they predict results at follow-up. 